Chapter 20, Lassiter's Way Footprints told the story of Little Fay's abduction. In anguish, Jane Withestein turned speechless to Lassiter, and confirming her fears, she saw him gray-faced, aged in all a moment, stricken as if by a mortal blow. Then all her life seemed to fall about her in wreck and ruin. It's all over, she heard her voice whisper. It's ended. I'm going. I'm going. Where, demanded Lassiter, suddenly looming darkly over her. To those cruel men. Speak names, thundered Lassiter. To Bishop Dyer, to Toll, went on Jane, shocked into obedience. Well, what for? I want little Fay. I can't live without her. They've stolen her as they stole Millie Earn's child. I must have little Fay. I want only her. I give up. I'll go and tell Bishop Dyer. I'm broken. I'll tell him I'm ready for the yoke. Only give me back Fay, and, and I'll marry Toll. Never, hissed Lassiter. His long arm leaped at her. Almost running, he dragged her under the cottonwoods, across the court, into the huge hall of Witherstein House, and he shut the door with a force that jarred the heavy walls. Black Star and Night and Bells, since their return, had been locked in this hall, and now they stamped on the stone floor. Lassiter released Jane, and like a dizzy man swayed from her with a hoarse cry, and leaned shaking against a table where he kept his rider's accoutrement. He began to fumble in his saddlebags. His action brought a clinking metallic sound, the rattling of gun cartridges. His fingers trembled as he slipped cartridges into an extra belt, but as he buckled it over the one he habitually wore, his hands became steady. The second belt contained two guns, smaller than the black one swinging low, and he slipped them round so that his coat hid them. Then he fell to swift action. Jane Witherstein watched him, fascinated but uncomprehending, and she saw him rapidly saddle Black Star and Knight. Then he drew her into the light of the huge windows, standing over her, gripping her arm with fingers like cold steel. Yes, Jane, it's ended, but you're not going to die her. I'm going instead. Looking at him, he was so terrible of aspect she could not comprehend his words. Who was this man with a face gray as death, with eyes that would have made her shriek had she the strength? With the strange, ruthlessly bitter lips, where was the gentle Lassiter? What was his presence in the hall, about him, about her, this cold, invisible presence? Yes, it's ended, Jane, he was saying, so awfully quiet and cool and implacable. I'm going to make a little call. I'll lock you in here, and when I get back, have the saddlebags full of meat and bread, and be ready to ride. Lassiter, cried Jane. Desperately, she tried to meet his gray eyes, in vain. Desperately, she tried again, fought herself as feeling and thought resurged in torment, and she succeeded. And then she knew. No, 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 she wailed. You said you'd forego your vengeance. You promised not to kill Bishop Dyer. If you want to talk to me about him, leave off the bishop. I don't understand that name or its use. Oh, hadn't you forgone your vengeance on, on Dyer? Yes, but your actions, your words, your guns, your terrible looks. They don't seem foregoing vengeance? Jane, now it's justice. You'll kill him? If God lets me live another hour, if not God, then the devil who drives me. You'll kill him for yourself, for your vengeful hate? No. For Millie Earn's sake? No. For little Fay's? No. Oh, for whose? For yours. His blood on my soul, whispered Jane, and she fell to her knees. This was the long pending hour of fruition, and the habit of years, the religious passion of her life leaped from lethargy, and the long months of gradually drifting to doubt were as if they had never been. If you spill his blood, it'll be on my soul and on my father's. Listen, and she clasped her knees and clung there as he tried to raise her. Listen, am I nothing to you? Woman, don't trifle with words. I love you, and I'll soon prove it. I'll give myself to you. I'll ride away with you, marry you, if only you'll spare him. His answer was a cold, ringing, terrible laugh. Lassiter, I'll love you. Spare him. No. She sprang up in despairing, breaking spirit, and encircling his neck with her arms, she held him in an embrace that he strove vainly to loosen. Lassiter, would you kill me? I'm fighting my last fight for the principles of my youth. Love of religion. Love of father. You don't know. You can't guess the truth, and I can't speak ill. I'm losing it all. I'm changing. All I've gone through is nothing to this hour. Pity me, help me in my weakness. You're strong again, oh, so cruelly, coldly strong. You're killing me. I see you, I feel you, as some other Lassiter. My master, be merciful, spare him. 
His answer was a ruthless smile. She clung to him, and leaning her panting breast on him, and lifted her face to his. Lassiter, I do love you. It slipped out of my agony. It comes suddenly with a terrible blow of truth. You are a man. I never knew it till now. Some wonderful change came to me when you buckled on those guns and showed that gray, awful face. I loved you then. All my life I've loved, but never as now. No woman can love like a broken woman. If it were not for one thing, just one thing, and yet... I can't speak it. I glory in your manhood, the lion in you that means to slay for me. Believe me, and spare dire. Be merciful. Great as it's in you to be great. Oh, listen and believe. I have nothing. But I'm a woman, a beautiful woman, Lassiter, a passionate, loving woman, and I love you. Take me, hide me in some wild place, and love me and mend my broken heart. Spare him and take me away. She lifted her face closer and closer to his until their lips nearly touched, and she hung upon his neck, and with strength almost spent, pressed and still pressed her palpitating body to his. Kiss me, she whispered blandly. No, not at your price, he answered. His voice had changed, or she had lost clearness of hearing. Kiss me. Are you a man? Kiss me and save me. Jane, you never played fair with me, and now you're blister in your lips, blackening in your soul with lies. By the memory of my mother, by my Bible, no, no, I have no Bible, but by my hope of heaven, I swear I love you. Lassiter's gray lips formed soundless words that meant even her love could not avail to bend his will. As if the hold of her arms was that of a child's, he loosened it and stepped away. Wait, don't go. Oh, hear a last word. May a more just and merciful God than the God I was taught to worship judge me, forgive me, save me, for I can no longer keep silent. Lassiter, in pleading for Dyer, I've been pleading more for my father. My father was a Mormon master, close to the leaders of the church. It was my father who sent Dyer out to proselyte. It was my father who had the blue eyes eye and the beard of gold. It was my father you got trace of in the past years. Truly, Dyer ruined Millie Earn, dragged her from her home to Utah to Cottonwoods. But it was for my father. If Millie Earn was ever wife of a Mormon, that Mormon was my father. I never knew, never will know whether or not she was a wife. Blind I may be, Lassiter, fanatically faithful to a false religion I may have been, but I know justice, and my father is beyond human justice. Surely he is meeting just punishment somewhere. Always it has appalled me the thought of your killing dire for my father's sins, so I have prayed. Jane, the past is dead. In my love for you, I forgot the past. This thing I'm about to do ain't for myself or Millie or Fay. It's not because of anything that ever happened in the past, but for what is happening right now. It's for you. And listen, since I was a boy, I never thank God for anything. If there is a God, and I've come to believe it, I thank him now for the years that have made me Lassiter. I can reach down and feel these big guns and know what I can do with them. And Jane... Only one of the miracles Dara professes to believe in can save him. Again, for Jane Witherstein came the spinning of her brain in darkness, and as she whirled in endless chaos, she seemed to be falling at the feet of a luminous figure, a man, Lassiter, who had saved her from herself, who could not be changed, who would slay rightfully. Then she slipped into utter blackness. When she recovered from her faint, she became aware that she was lying on a couch near the window in her sitting room. Her brow felt damp and cold and wet. Someone was chafing her hands. She recognized Jedkins, then saw that his lean, hard face wore the hue and look of excessive agitation. Jedkins, she spoke weakly. Ah, uh, Miss Witherstein, you're coming round fine. Now just lay still a little. You're all right. Everything's all right. Where is he? Who? Lassiter. You needn't worry none about him. Where is he? Tell me instantly. Well, he's in the other room patching up a few trifling bullet holes. Ah, oh, Bishop Dyer? When I seen him last, a matter of half an hour ago, he was on his knees. He was some busy, but he wasn't praying. How strangely you talk. I'll sit up. I'm, well, strong again. Tell me, Dyer on his knees? What was he doing? Well, begging your pardon for blunt talk, Miss Witherstein. Dyer was on his knees and not praying. You remember his big broad hands? You've seen him raised in blessing over the old gray men and little curly-headed children like, like Fay Larkin. Come to think of that, I disremember ever hearing of his lifting his big hands and blessing over a woman. Well, when I seen him last, 
Just a little while ago, he was on his knees, not praying, as I remarked, and he was pressing his big hands over some bigger wounds. Man, you drive me mad. Did Lassiter kill Dyer? Yes. Did he kill Toll? No. Toll's out of the village with most of his riders. He's expecting back before evening. Lassiter will have to get away before Toll and his riders come in. It's sure death for him here. And what's for you too, Miss Witherstein? There'll be some of an uprising when Toll gets back. I shall ride away with Lassiter Judkins. Tell me all you saw. You know about this killing. She realized, without wonder or amaze, how Judkins' one word, affirming the death of Dyer, that the catastrophe had fallen, had completed the change whereby she had been molded or beaten or broken into another woman. She felt calm, slightly cold, strong as she had not been strong since the first shadow fell upon her. I just saw about all of it, Miss Witherstein, and I'll be glad to tell you, if you only have patience with me, said Judkins earnestly. You see, I've been peculiarly interested, and naturally I'm some excited, and I talk a lot that maybe ain't necessary, but I can't help that. I was at the meeting house where Dyer was holding court. You know he always acts like magistrate and judge when tolls away, and the trial was for trying what's left of my boy riders that helped me hold your cattle for a lot of hatched up things the boys never did. We're used to that, and the boys wouldn't have minded being locked up for a while or having to dig ditches or whatever the judge laid down. You see, I divided the gold you gave me among all my boys, and they hid it, and they all feel rich. Howsomever, court was adjourned before the judge passed sentence. Yes, ma'am, court was adjourned, some strange and quick, much as if lightning had struck the meeting house. I had trouble attending a trial, but I got in. There was a good many people there, all my boys, and Judge Dyer with his several clerks. Also, he had with him five riders who had been guarding him pretty close of late. There was Carter, Wright, Jenkinson, and two new riders from Stonebridge. I didn't hear their names, but I heard they was handy men with guns, and they looked more like rustlers than riders. Anyway, there they was, all five in a row. Judge Dyer was telling Willie Kern, one of my best and steadiest boys, Dyer was telling him how there was a ditch open near Willie's home, letting water through his lot, where it hadn't ought to go. And Willie was trying to get a word in to prove he wasn't at home all the day it happened. Which was true, as I know, but Willie couldn't get a word in. And then Judge Dyer went on laying down the law. And all to once he happened to look down the long room, and if ever any man turned stone, he was that man. Naturally, I looked back to see what had acted so powerful strange on the judge, and there, halfway up the room, in the middle of the wide aisle, stood Lassiter. All white and black he looked, and I can't think of anything he resembled, unless it's Steph. Fenner's made that same room some still in Chile when he called Tool, but this was different. I give my word, Miss Witherstein, that I went cold to my very marrow. I don't know why, but Lassiter had a way about him that's awful. He spoke a word. A name. I couldn't understand it, though he spoke clear as a bell. I was too excited, maybe. Judge Dyer must have understood it, and a lot more that was a mystery to me, for he pitched forward out of his chair right onto the platform. Then them five riders, Dyer's bodyguards, they jumped up, and two of them that I found out afterward were the strangers from Stonebridge. They piled right out of a window, so quick you couldn't catch your breath. It was plain they wasn't Mormons. Jenkinson, Carter, and Wright eyed Lassiter for what must have been a second and then seemed like an hour, and they went white and strung. But they didn't weaken or lose their nerve. I had a good look at Lassiter. He stood sort of stiff, bending a little, and both his arms were crooked, and his hands looked like a hog's claws. There ain't no telling how his eyes looked. I know this, though, and that is his eyes could read the mind of any man about to throw a gun, and in watching him, of course. I couldn't see the three men go for their guns, and though I was looking right at Lassiter, looking hard, I couldn't see how he drawed. He was quicker in eyesight, that's all. But I seen the red spurting of his guns, heard his shots just the littlest instant before I heard the shots of the riders. And when I turned, Wright and Carter was drawn, and Jenkinson, whose tough as a steer, was pulling the trigger of a wobbling gun. But it was plain he was shot through plum center and suddenly he fell with a crash, and his gun clattered on the floor. Then there was a hell of a silence. Nobody breathed. Sartin I didn't, anyway. 
I saw Lester slip a smoking gun back in a belt, but he hadn't thrown either of them big black guns, and I thought that strange. And all of this was happening quick. You can't imagine how quick. There was a scraping on the floor, and Dyer got up, his face like lead. I wanted to watch Lassiter, but Dyer's face, once I saw it was like that, glued my eyes. I seen him go for his gun. Well, I could have done better, quicker, and then there was a thundering shot from Lassiter, and he hit Dyer's right arm, and his gun went off as it dropped. He looked at Lassiter like a cornered sage wolf and sort of howled and reached down for his gun. He just picked it up off the floor and was raising it when another thundering shot came, almost tore that arm off, so it seemed to me. The gun dropped again and he went down on his knees, kind of floundering after that. It was some strange and terrible to see his awful earnestness. Why would such a man cling so to life? Anyway, he got the gun with the left hand and was raising it, pulling trigger in his madness, when the third thunder and shot hit his left arm and he dropped the gun again. But that left arm wasn't useless yet, for he grabbed up the gun, and with a shaken arm that would have been painful to me in any other man, he began to shoot. One wild bullet struck a man twenty feet from Lassiter, and it killed that man, as I seen afterward. Then come a bunch of thunder and shots, nine I calculated after, for they come so quick I couldn't count them, and I knew Lassiter had turned the black guns loose on Dyer. I'm telling you straight, Miss Witherstein, for I want you to know. Afterward, you'll get over it. I've seen some soul-sacking scenes in this Utah border, but this was the awfulest. I remember I closed my eyes, and for a minute I thought of the strangest places, out of place there, such as you'd never dream would come to mind. I saw the sage and running hosses, and that's the beautifulest sight to me. And I saw dim things in the dark, and there was a kind of humming in my ears. And I remember distinctly, for it was what made all these things were out of my mind and opened my eyes, I remember distinctly it was the smell of gunpowder. The court had about adjourned for that judge. He was on his knees and he wasn't praying. He was gasping and trying to press his big flapping crippled hands over his body. Lassiter had sent all of his last thundering shots through his body. That was Lassiter's way. And Lassiter spoke, and if I ever forget his words, I'll never forget the sound of his voice. Proselyter! I reckon you'd better call quick to that God who reveals Hisself to you on earth, because he won't be visiting the place you're going to. And then I seen Dyer look at his big hanging hands that wasn't big enough for all the work he set them to. And he looked up at Lassiter, and then he stared horrible at something that wasn't Lassiter, nor anyone there, nor the room, nor the branches of purple sage peeping into the window. Whatever he seen, it was the look of a man who discovers something too late. That's a terrible look, and with a horrible, understanding cry, he slid forward on his face. Judkins paused in his narrative, breathing heavily while he wiped his perspiring brow. That's about all, he concluded. Lassiter left the meeting house, and I hurried to catch up with him. He was bleeding from three gunshots, none of them much to bother him. And we come right up here. I found you laying in the hall, and I had to work some over you. Jane Witherstein offered up no prayer for Dyer's soul. Lassiter's step sounded in the hall, the familiar, soft, silver-clinking step, and she heard it with thrilling new emotions, in which was a vague joy in her very fear of him. The door opened, and she saw him, the old Lassiter, slow, easy, gentle, cool, yet not exactly the same Lassiter. She rose, and for a moment her eyes blurred and swam with tears. "'Are you all, all right?' she asked tremulously. I reckon. Lassiter, I'll ride away with you. Hide me till danger is past, till we are forgotten. Then take me where you will. Your people shall be my people, and your God my God. He kissed her hand with a quaint grace and courtesy that came to him in rare moments. Black Star and Knight are ready, he said simply. His quiet mention of the black racer spurred Jane to action. Hurrying to her room, she changed into her rider's suit, packed her jewelry and the gold that was left, and all the woman's apparel for which there was space in the saddlebags, and then returned to the hall. Black Star stamped his iron-shod hooves and tossed his beautiful head and eyed her with knowing eyes. "'Judkins, I give bells to you,' said Jane. "'I hope you will always keep him and be good to him.' Judkins mumbled thanks that he could not speak fluently, and his eyes flashed. Lassiter strapped Jane's saddlebags onto Black Star and led the racer out into the court. Judkins, you ride with Jane out into the sage. If you see any riders come and shout quick twice. And Jane, don't look back. I'll catch up soon. 
We'll get to the break in the pass before midnight, and then wait until morning to go down. Black Star bent his graceful neck and bowed his noble head, and his broad shoulders yielded as he knelt for Jane to mount. She rode out of the court beside Judkins, through the grove, across the wide lane into the sage, and she realized that she was leaving Witherstein House forever. And she did not look back. A strange, dreamy, calm peace pervaded her soul. Her doom had fallen upon her, but, instead of finding life no longer worth living, she found it doubly significant, full of sweetness as the western breeze, beautiful and unknowing as the sage slope, stretching its purple sunset shadows before her. She became aware of Judkin's hand touching hers. She heard him speak a husky goodbye, then into the place of bells shot the dead black, keen, racy nose of night, and she knew Lassiter rode beside her. "'Don't look back,' he said, and his voice, too, was not clear. Facing straight ahead, seeing only the waving, shadowy sage, Jane held out her gauntleted hand to feel it enclosed in a strong clasp. So she rode on without a backward glance at the beautiful grove of cottonwoods. She did not seem to think of the past of which she left forever, but of the color and mystery and wildness of the sage slope leading down to Deception Pass and of the future. She watched the shadows lengthening down the slope. She felt the cool west wind sweeping by from the rear, and she wondered at low yellow clouds sailing swiftly over her and beyond. Don't look back, said Lassiter. Thick driving belts of smoke traveled by on the wind, and with it came a strong pungent odor of burning wood. Lassiter had fired Witherstein House. Jane did not look back. A misty veil obscured the clear searching gaze she had kept steadfastly upon the purple slope and the dim lines of canyons. It passed, as passed the rolling clouds of smoke, and she saw the valley deepening into the shades of twilight. Night came on, swift as fleet racers, and the stars peeped out to brighten and glow, and the huge, windy, eastern heave of sage level paled under a rising moon and turned to silver. Blanched in moonlight, the sage yet seemed to hold its hue of purple, and was infinitely more wild and lonely. So the night hours wore on, and Jane Witherstein never once looked back. End of chapter 20